So one of the things that uh, this introduces is the idea of a function. And everybody took one, 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 three. We're missing someone here. Um, recently has the idea of a function. A function is a named block of code that you can invoke from elsewhere in your code. So that's what this does, is it walks us through writing a function and different ways of running it. So we write a function called main, and then we put some code down here, which invokes that function. And this looks pretty weird. You may not have seen this, maybe you have, underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, equals, equals, underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore. If that is true, then invoke main. So we'll explain in here, in our class right now, what that actually does. If we can run command, um, Python from the command prompt, We'll try other ways of loading the file and getting it to run. And we'll also do it from the shell. We'll import it from the shell and run it. And we'll do it from another script. So the idea is, is you can make a library of, of your own functions, put them in a file, and then you can import them into your code as you need. And typically what you wind up doing is um, as you go along in a course, you wind up writing what I call utility functions. Like some application, some function that'll ask somebody for input and it'll validate that it's an integer or not. And if it's not, it'll continue to loop asking them for that. That's a useful function. You write it once, you can keep using it. You can copy and paste it into your code or you can put it into a utility library that you could import every time you write a program. Now, if you do that, I'm gonna need that as well. You're going to need to give me everything so that I can grade it because if I don't have a utility library, I can't make sure it works. So let's play with a little bit, bit of that in class. But first, let's look at the other assignment. Ought to be something that you write yourself rather than doing stuff by rote because you need a mixture of those. Hopefully, as time goes by, you do less by rote and more on your own. Hey, Denise, I owe you, I owe you a message, and I haven't responded yet. I apologize for that. I'll get it to you as soon as class is done today. So we're talking about the homework, and we're going to do an assignment that kind of covers some of the same material. Have you been able to get the textbook? Lots of yes. people have not. Okay, okay, good. Then you're good to go. We pushed back due dates since uh, some people couldn't get the textbook. Alrighty, these are from the text, but they are programming problems rather than just type in rote. So, write a program that displays the dimensions of a letter size sheet of paper. There are 25.4 millimeters per inch. Use constants and comments in your code. So you're going to use this, the, uh, the conversion ratio to figure out that 8.5 inches is this many millimeters and 11 inches is this many millimeters. Additionally, write a program that computes and displays a perimeter and the length of its diagonal. All right, to calculate the length of its diagonal, you have to know, what is it, the Pythagorean theorem? Yeah. So, yeah, you'll have to know that. And if you ever get stuck on a formula, just text me, and I'll tell you. This isn't a math class. You're not being tested on whether you know that formula, and you can always look it up, too. Write a program that reads a number and displays the square cube and fourth power. Use star star only for the fourth power. So we'll have to talk about what star star does. We'll get to that. Oh, what do you know? Hint, the diagonal of a rectangle can be calculated as that. All right, and then one more program. Just a little bit of a turtle program. I tend to give people lots of turtle programs in 1113. I'm not sure the other instructors do so much. So this is just an introduction to the turtles because the turtles are a graphical way of representing concepts. You can see loops being executed. You know, you can see the result of changing functions and stuff like that. So this should not be overly rigorous homework. You do have to do, you know, this stuff yourself. It's not typing by rote. 
I don't think it's going to be super challenging. If it is, then let me know and ask for help. All righty, so on the other page, we had some weird stuff there. We had that uh, if underscore underscore name equals underscore underscore main stuff. Oh, and by the way, if the name of the document doesn't seem to match the name of the folder, just go with it. It means that I've shuffled things around, you know, from the time that I wrote the assignment, and I don't necessarily go in and rename all the assignment pages. And if they don't look like they make any sense, well, I changed my naming scheme halfway through. So if last semester to try to make it more sensible, let's take a look and see if we can figure out what's going on. Chapter 2, assignments A and B and C and D. That, that's the way that those are worded. Chapter 3, A, B, C, and D. You'll notice that I opened up. We should not have due dates. I'll fix that. I opened up Chapter 3's homework, so you can look ahead and work ahead if you want. I certainly don't need due dates on those. I'll fix those. Eventually, I'll have the whole shebang open up so that you can work as fast as you, as you want on them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and launch Idle. If you like PyCharm, that's totally cool. I like PyCharm, but for some reason, my, my PyCharm is being weird right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I don't know what it's doing. It's being cranky on you? Like, it says it's open, but there's no window for it. Oh, that's useful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's open right there. All righty. So, it's not there. do this. Print underscore, or print parentheses. Just do this from the shell. Don't make a new file. Underscore, underscore, two underscores. Name, underscore, underscore. This is the context in which we are running. This is our main thread of application. Um, so we can use this to determine whether we have launched the particular file that we are in or not. And that's what that if statement down there does. We'll, uh, we'll play with that a little bit more. But for now, let's do a file, new file. And whenever you turn in an assignment, I would like for you to put your name up here and the date and what we are working on. If it's just a daily assignment, put today's date. Is today the 30th or the 31st? 30th. All right. My brain is compensating for the fact that we're supposed to go up by one year by trying to type in 2019 each time because I don't want to type in 2017. Apparently, I want that safety margin. So the way a function works and this is ahead of where we are in the book, but like I said, just about everybody in here has had a programming class that used methods or functions. So we're going to define a function named main, and it's not going to take any parameters. And in this language, everything is done not by curly braces, but by tabs. So as soon as I hit colon, all right, I don't even care what this does at something at this point. So let's just print hi there. And down at the bottom, let's invoke the main function. And why would you do that? Why, why do you need to put something in main? You don't have to. In a lot of other programming lang languages, you do have to define an entry point for your application. So if you become a C, C++, C Sharp, Java programmer, you are going to need a main. This just kind of builds you, gets you used to the idea, but you don't have to do it. But the reason why you do it this way is once we add that little other little boilerplate, that if underscore underscore business, it means that you can import this module without it running automatically. And I'll show you what I mean. Do a, go ahead and do a save as and save it into your favorite directory. I'm just going to call mine Jan 30 because I'm feeling really creative. Alrighty, now I'm going to run it. Make sure it works. All right, it prints hi there. I'm happy enough with that. Now we're going to create a second script file that's going to import this file. I 
did not mean to do a save as. I meant to do a file new. So new file. Your name, date, sample functions. All righty. So what do we want to do? We want to import that module so that we can call that main method, that main function. So we're going to import January 30.py. Now when we save this, we don't want to call it Jan 30 because that would overwrite the last one we have. So let's just do file save as and call it Jan 30B or whatever name you give it. Just remember what you called your other one because we're that's what you have to add the import for. So Jan 30B is going to be the guy who loads up Jan 30 and invokes the method in it. All right, let's add a print message. Print, I am about to run main. And then let's invoke main. Now let's print, okay, done. If you want the program to hang there, waiting at the end, so that you could launch it from the user interface by double-clicking it, change the last print to an input statement. Doesn't matter. I'll be right over there. Okay, so if I run this, well, I guess uh, we could be getting that error. That wasn't my goal. Almost there. I apologize. Died. Change that to the name of your file that the main is stored in. Jan30.main. Like that. So what this says is I want you to make those functions available to me. And what this says is actually go ahead and invoke that function. And Denise, as soon as I see this run, I'll be over there. Okay. Now if you run the program, you're going to see something kind of odd. Do you remember what our main did? It printed hi there. It was only supposed to print that between I am about to run main and OK done. But it also did it as soon as we did import Jan 30. Typically when you import code, you don't want it to immediately trigger, you know, some running. You want to import that code so that that stuff's available to your program, but you don't actually want to run it right on the spot. Now, I wanted this stuff to happen. I didn't want anything to automatically happen just because I did an import. So we're going to fix that. So define main needs to look like this. I'm sorry that I got rid of that too quickly. Like that. So it needs to be DEF main parentheses in parentheses colon and then print hi there like that. And then down here at the bottom underneath all that stuff we need the main. So in this language, you don't use the curly braces, you hit the tabs. And so just like he said, we need to pay careful attention to whether we are in, in the favor of doing under save as and take the space out between Jan and 30 or make it an underscore. So file save as. Define, but we're actually going to call it there. Okay. We need to do that. Parentheses in parentheses. So it's going to call your function in Java or C. Now let's run it. Yeah, hello blocker. Alright, 
So now create another one called Jan30B that looks like this. So we're going to fix it so that it doesn't run as soon as you import it. And that's what that boilerplate if stuff around it means. So if underscore underscore name underscore underscore is equal to two equals quote underscore underscore main underscore underscore colon run main. Now the fact that this is called main and this is called main this could have been called anything. This could have been called Fred Flintstone. That has to be main for this to work. That one right there, the if statement does have to be main. Okay, so why did we do that? Now if you run this application, excuse me, if you run your original Jan 30, it doesn't do anything. Heck, no, yeah, it does. It does do something. It does exactly what we wanted it to do. And the reason why is that when we run it, Tell you what, remember when we did that print main stuff? Or print, yeah, print main. Let's tack that on. Underneath high there, do print underscore underscore name, underscore underscore. No spaces like I just accidentally added. It's okay to put spaces around it, but you don't have to. I just space things out to make it easier to read. So when I run it, we're going to see that it says main right there, hi there, and it prints out its name. I wish now that I had done that before I did this, so I don't care if you make this change because I'm going to immediately undo it, but I want you to see what it looks like when I run it. I uncommented out my if statement and backed the... Uh, to call the main up. So now when I run it from over here, it doesn't say that main is the context of which we are running it. Instead, it says that the context it's running in is the name of the module. So that if statement just lets us distinguish whether we just did an import or not. And if it doesn't totally sink in, that's okay. You can accept it on faith for now. Or you can go ahead and Google up why people do that. Because the book doesn't mention it, I do not believe. Okay, so now that I've done that, now that I've made that change, if I come back up here and run it, it doesn't automatically trigger that function. It waits until we actually call it. So this is considered a, a professional way of handling it. You ought to structure your code like that. If you don't, I'm not going to count you off. I'm not going to, you know, you didn't write a main, you didn't invoke main like that. I'm not going to count you off, you know, for the simple assignments. But it's a good, it's a pro way of doing it. And there are other benefits, there are advantages to doing it this way as well. One of the advantages is that if you have multiple functions defined, well, typically if you write a program code and it's not organized into functions, then it might not spot some of the syntax errors until it actually gets to that line. So it'll start running and it'll go and it'll go and then it'll blow up halfway down with a syntax error. But if you put everything into functions with a call to main down at the bottom, it goes ahead and checks the syntax of everything. So you're far more sure that it's going to work if you organize your code into functions, even if at this point you only have one function, which is the main function. There's one more comment I was going to make about that. In this language, the order in which you define functions is important. It has to see the DEF for that function before it can call it. If we reverse these things like that, don't do this because it's going to break the code. If I reversed them like that, it wouldn't work. It's going to say main is not defined. That's the way that C and C++ work as well. It's not the way that Java and C-sharp work. So if you go on and, and uh, work in some other languages, sometimes the order is important, sometimes it is not. I'm going to go ahead and fix that so that it works. Okay. 
So that may be enough to talk about functions for right now. We're going to get into the idea of operators and operands. And I'm not going to explain everything because the book is an important. Okay, it's, it's going to need to be done in a minute. The uh, invention in this language as opposed to other ones is extraordinarily important. Uh, what do you do with the language? So we have the idea, or we will, you know how to do math, use addition and subtraction and stuff like that. We're going to go ahead and do some of that. I'm going to cover this code up. No, I'm not. There's one more change I want to make to it. Notice how we had to prefix the name of the method with the name of the module it's in. What if you don't want to do that? What if you just want to be able to call it main without putting jan30 dot in front of it? You could do that. Change your syntax to look like this. From Jan30, import main. That does kind of a, of a razor selection. It takes only that one function out of that file. And it makes it so that we can delete. That Jan30 stuff in front of it. So I just made that change. And I just made that change. And it should work just exactly the same as it did before. Could make a liar out of me too, but we'll find out. All right. So if you do import Jan30, it brings in all the functions and auto runs any unindented code in it. If you do it this way from Jan30, import main, it just brings in that one function. Makes main available to us to call and you can invoke it without using that dot syntax. Doesn't matter which one you use, it's up to you. Okay. So it doesn't matter which program we add this stuff to, 30 or 38. I'm going to go ahead and add it to my original. So we have math, we have operators. To do a single line comment, you use the, uh, the hashtag. But if to do a multi-line comment, you can start your multi-line comment with three quotes. Three single quotes or double quotes will do. And you can type in a whole bunch of stuff. And then you can use three more quotes and it'll stop it. So that way, if I'm going to type a bunch of notes into my program, I'll do it that way. So that I don't have to prefix every line with a hashtag. Just makes it easier. And the reason why I'm going to do that is I'm going to add some notes. You don't have to type this stuff in. But operators are symbols. that are defined 
as part of the language. That's, those are things like plus, minus, multiply, divide. There's double slash, and then there's percent, and there's star star. Those are just some of our operators. There are other ones that are used programmatically, um, not for doing math. You know, a parenthesis is considered an operator as well. But, but we're going to focus on the math operators right now. These are the, the math operators, the arithmetic operators. We know what most of those do. We know that plus is addition, minus. I know it sounds childish to say plus and minus with an addition and subtraction. Multiply, divide. This one stands for floor division. It means round down. So we're going to play with that just a little bit. This one means modulus, which is remainder of. And this one means to the power of. So I'm going to go ahead and this one kind of bugs people because it looks like a comment in other languages. If you've you ever used a program mean language that's based on C, like Java or C Sharp or whatever, you're used to doing slash slash to mean comments, which is the same thing that we use our hashtags for. But anyways, so this stands for floor division, what other languages call integer division. Floor division rounds the answer down to fit into an int, to fit into an integer. That one means modulus. Modulus means remainder. And this is to the power of, or exponent. So let's play with those ideas just a little bit. I'm going to be typing print a lot, so go ahead and just copy it so that you can paste it. Unless you type really fast. Print four times three. And then copy that about five or six times. And then we're going to change this. So four times three, four divided by three, four floor division three. For modulus 3, the percent sign, and addition and subtraction. Now let's run it. This stuff all needed to be tabbed over to be part of main. So I'm going to highlight all that text. You can hit the tab key to push it over, or you can do format indent. And it looks like there's a, con a control right brace or whatever that'll do that as well the only reason I'm doing that is because I want it to be in the same indention level as main and to make that clear I'm going to cut my comment and paste it above main all right so when I run it we should see the results of that math all righty so 4 times 3 is 12. That's what we would expect. 4 divided by 3 is 1.33333. 4 divided by 3 rounded down is 1, right? 1.33 rounded down is 1. 4 modulus 3, well, how many times does 3 go into 4? 3 goes into 4 one time with a remainder of, we have to go back into our grade school thinking, 1. That's what modulus does. So 4 plus 3 is 7, 4 minus 3 is 1. Let's change some of these numbers. What is 5 divided by 3, 5 modulus 3, or 5 floor division 3, and 5 divided by uh, modulus 3? Let's not run it. Let's just predict it. What's 5 divided by 3? It's 1.666667 or whatever. So what's floor division? If we took that 1.667 and rounded it down, it's going to be 1. It's not going to round it up. Floor division always rounds down. That's why it's called floor rather than the word round, which does do something. There is a function called round. Then we have, so after 3 goes into 5 one time, what is the remainder? 
2. So this is going to be 2. That's going to print out 2. And if we run it, we'll find out that that's indeed the case. I need to close the shell because it's putting text down at the bottom where we can't see it. I'm sorry, didn't you? Tabbing in this language is annoying, but it's important. It's the only way that it knows inside which module the, codes are, the code is defined. Semicolons in Java. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no semicolons in this language, although they don't break the code. We can play with semicolons. What they do is that they divvy up. Print hello. You don't have to do this. It's just a demo. Print. Goodbye. Like that. That will work. Is there ever a reason to write your code like that? I can't think of a reason, but if you want to, you can. You can't put semicolons in there. Yeah, so you could if you want your code to look like Java or C. You could put uh, semicolons at the end of each line. If you need a line to span more than one, if you need a, a command, a statement to span more than one line, you can usually do that. Like print, hello, comma, and then hit enter. There, my good quote, comma, friend. Like that. That works. But, Unlike some languages which ignore white space completely, I don't think you can do this. A is equal to 2 plus 3. I think that we're going to finally have broken it there. Yep, invalid syntax. Now, I'm sure that there's some special character you could put at the end of the line in order to get it to, to break it up like that. But uh, I did not mean to close that. All right, so if you have an operator, you're also feeding it pieces of data in order to act upon. Those are what are known as operands. So all of these arithmetic operators are binary operators, not meaning that they all deal in ones and zeros, but meaning that they take two parameters. Parameter is not the exact correct term. Operand is the exact correct term. So if you're going to do this, print A plus B. If you didn't have B there, it would give you a syntax error because the addition operator requires two operands in order to act. Now, these operands can be their own expressions. Print A plus B plus C, right? You could, uh, in this case, the operand, the left operand, excuse me, the right operand for that is another expression. So if you're looking at this, what is going to get added first, right? If this was 1 plus 2 plus 3, which values get added first? Two and three. Yeah, two and three get added first. 
and then that results in 5, and then it can add 1 and 5 to get 6. And so that follows the rules of PEMDAS. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division and floor division. Okay, so the acronym's not quite good because uh, programming languages have more things than grade school arithmetic did. And add and subtract. That's the order of priority precedence in which things are done. Not parents, parents. So parentheses are used to force the order of evaluation. And it's never a bad idea to use parentheses, even if you are quite comfortable with the rules of PEMDAS. If it, who made up that dumb acronym or phrase, mnemonic, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Got to memorize it, but really, you know, okay. So everything on this line of precedence are equal, and so they just get done left to right. Same for addition and subtraction. They are of equal precedence, so they are just done left to right. Mm -hmm. So if you have this expression 1 plus 2 times 3, what is the first thing that gets done? The addition or the multiplication? Multiplication because it's higher in precedence. 1 plus 2 to the power of 3 times 4. What gets done first there? Yeah, this gets done first. If you, uh, why did I do the carrots? Because I'm used to typing carrots for exponents, but it's actually star star. My mistake. If you type in carrot carrot, I'm going to count you off in the exam, and then you can come and throw a brick at me for having done it here. So, anyways, if you wanted it to really be 2 to the power of 3 times 4, you would put parentheses around the 3 times 4 to force it. There are other operators as well as math. I need to delete that because my program's going to be crashing every time I run that. There are logical operators. Logical operators are and and or. But then there are also comparison operators to check to see if things are equal or not equal. So let's talk about those first. I'm going to scroll back up to my notes, and we're going to add in comparison operators, which are less than. I'm going to do this in a very specific order. Greater than or equal. Greater than, less than or equal. Two equal signs, and then exclamation mark equal. Now, the, way, the reason I worded it in that exact same order that very specific order is that these are opposites of each other. This does a comparison. This checks to see if they're not equal. And does it look weird to say that less than, the opposite of it is greater than or equal? Yeah, it does, but it's true. Why is that? Because if you do, if A, you don't have to type this, but if you want to put it in your notes, you know, if 3 is greater than less than 4, if you wanted to write the reverse of that, you would not do if 3 is greater than 4. This is not the reverse of that. It looks like it is, but it's not. And I'll show you why. Because if you made this, if 3 is less than 3, that's true. Well, 3 
No, it's not. 3 is not less than 3, so that's a false. If you wanted to get the exact opposite of 3 less than 3 so that it would equal true, you could not do 3 greater than 3. Because if you wanted this to be false, but you wanted this to be true, well, that's not a true statement. 3 is not greater than 3. So in order to flip the logic of it to get it to print out true, you would have to make it greater than or equal. And if that makes sense, great. If it doesn't, just take it on faith that the exact opposite of less than is greater than or equal. And the reason why is that you have to handle the situation where the values are exactly equal. So again, those are binary operators. They require two operands. The operand is just the value on either side of the operator. So we have our comparison operators. What do you use comparison operators for? You usually, you put them in an if statement or you in store their value in a type of variable known as a Boolean variable. So I'm going to add a few more notes here. Types. Types of data. We have string data, which is just anything you can type in on the keyboard. And in our program, we enter string data as stuff between quotes, like names, or numbers, or symbols, like that. You can also have a string that's just two quotes. That's known as an empty string. In this language, unlike Java or C, Single quotes and double quotes are treated the same. Along with strings, you have ints, which are integers, which are whole numbers. Numbres, that's the Spanish version. All righty. Then we have floats, which are floating point values, which are numbers that support decimal points. And then we have one more type. We have Boolean values. Boolean is a kind of math where you only have two numbers in the entire math system. Zero and one, or true and false. In this case, we're going to call them true and false. I capitalize those. Because in this language, unlike some other languages, the, the values true and false, the built-in languages, actually need to be capitalized. All right, so we're going to use our comparison operators. Tell you what, let's just, no, nah, if, if, if I put it into the shell, here's what I was tempted to do. I was tempted to go back to the shell and then to type in my expressions there, right, like 3, less than 2, it would tell me right away that that's false. 3 greater than 2, it would tell me right away that that's true. That's inside the shell. If you typed in 3 divided by 2 inside the code itself, it's not going to work. It's going to give you a syntax error. I believe we could give it a shot. I'm just going to type in 3 divided by 2 right up at the top. See if it prints. No, nope, not 3 divided by 2. Greater than. I believe that's going to be a syntax error, so you don't necessarily need to type that. Well, what do you know? It wasn't, but it didn't print anything either. But anyways, the comparison operators are usually used as part of Boolean expressions like this. If 3 is greater than 2, and you don't need the parentheses, by the way. In some languages you do. I just type them by habit. Print less than. Else, colon, print, greater than or equal. So if I run it, it does say less than because, as a matter of fact, 3 is greater than 2. So this is a logical expression based on the comparison operator. A logical expression is one that evaluates to true or false. So 
this is evaluated. Is 3 greater than 2? Yeah, it is. And the logical, the comparison operators also have a precedence. Like what if you did this? If 3 plus 2, so 3 plus 3 is greater than 2. Is that going to be a syntax error? Is it going to work? Let's find out. It does say that it's less than. I got my logic backwards. Somebody needs to get a shoe ready. If I have the greater than sign there, then why would I print less than there? Uh, I was wondering you were wondering that, that yourself. All right, so why don't we change that to a less than sign? But anyways, now it's going to say that it's less than. That, excuse me, that it's greater than because 3 plus 3 is, in fact, greater than. What if we change that to a 1? What if we think that it's just doing that part? It's basing its result on that. Nope, it's not basing it on that. So the addition, the math operators have a higher precedence than the logical operators. But if you're ever in doubt, just use parentheses to force the matter. Nothing wrong with doing it like that. All right, now are you really in your program going to be comparing hard-coded numbers, which are known as literals? It, no, you're going to be using variables, like is A less than 2 or B not equal to 10 or whatever. So those are some of the expressions you can do. You can also store the result of a comparison like that in a Boolean variable. I'm just going to make up some Boolean variable names. Fred is equal to 1, equal, equal to 2. That looks stupid, but... Let's go ahead and put parentheses around it just to make it look clearer. Again, they're not necessary. And then let's do Barney is equal to 1 not equal to 2. So, Fred is going to be, is Fred going to be set to true or false? False. Right. Fred is false because 1 is equal, not equal to 2. Barney is true. Because this expression, 1 not equal to 2, is true. There is um, a logical operator that I did not mention, which is exclamation mark, which, which it means not, and it reverses the truthiness, to use the old Colbert Show um, term. So if you did this, 1 is equal, equal to 2, that would be false, but then that would flip it so that false becomes true. So the way the if statement works, okay, anytime you hit colon, you have to start tabbing, or else it's a syntax error. When you're done with that block of code, you stop inventing. So that's why that is indented. That's why that is not. This is the end of the block that's subordinate to the if statement. This is the end of blo the block of code that's subordinate to the else statement. Does an if statement require that you have one line of code there, no more, no less? No, you could have a thousand lines of code there that were indented after that if statement, just like this function. This function is getting inordinately long as we go further and further. All right, so along with our comparison operators, we have the logical operators. And I mentioned not, but we're going to also talk about or and and. And by the way, I upload these notes, so uh, if you need them, you can have them. If I go too quickly for you and you just want to watch, that's okay, but I really would like for you to get this stuff to work. So after class or when you get home, up, you know, I hate for to just say copy and paste, but, you know, get an upload into the Dropbox so you get credit for it. Logical operators, and, or, and not. Now, you Java C guys are used to that meaning and, that meaning or, and that meaning not. No. And this one, you really do use the word and, and or, and you can use not. I believe exclamation mark is also supported. I'm going to test that real quickly. I'm just going to go to the shell. I did not mean to 
quit the entire app. That was brilliant. No exclamation point because no exclamation point. Doesn't work. All right. All right. So if I print not one greater than two. Well, one greater than two is false, but the not will change it to a true. So what I was curious about is whether you can use the exclamation mark like you can in a lot of other languages. Well, at least in the shell. Yeah. If it doesn't work in the shell, it's not going to work in the script as well. Okay. I just typed exclamation point true. Right. That, that would have proven the point. You're right. Okay. So where was I? My logical operators are and, or, and not. The way that works is if you have and, it's again a binary operator with two operands, both sides of it have to be true before it evaluates to true. So if you have something like if A is equal to zero and B is equal to zero, and again the parentheses are not necessary, they're just a habit. Uh, I think if I'll do that because I teach Java before this and I think it's C plus plus after. So anyways, so there we go. This side and this side have to be true before the whole expression evaluates to true. If A is zero and B is zero, then it'll execute the code that's subordinate to the if statement. If either one of these is not true, it won't execute the code that's under the if statement. So you can build what's known as a truth table. And we're going to need to stop and take a roll fairly soon, but not quite yet. So if you have and, A and B, and the result, I wish it wasn't doing U, that gum, I need to switch to Python. Anyways, and the result, so true, no, I'm going to start with false. False, false, the result is false. False, true, the result is false. True and false, the result is false. The only time you get a true out of it is when they're both. Then you can make an or truth table. Or means either one could be true. So false, false, true, true, or false, No, it's not that they're the same. They both actually have to be true. It, there's an electrical engineering <coughs> exclusive or that kind of works like what you're talking about, but uh, yeah, we're, false, we're not going to be using false exclusive and false or. False. Right. False and false do return false because. It's evaluating to see whether that one's true and that one's true. And if they are both true, just like if you are hungry and you have money, go to the restaurant, right? You're not going to go to the restaurant if you're not hungry. You're not going to go to the restaurant unless you have money, well, or you have a credit card or, or a friend. And if so. you're not hungry and you don't have money, you're, gonna do you're still not going to go. You're still not going to go. Right, exactly. So the or, both, either side has to be true. If you have money or a credit card, go on a spending spree, right? Either one will let you go. So A or B and the result. I'm just going to copy those uh, for speed. So if you have money, nope. But you have a credit card? Yes, you do. You're going to go on your spending spree. Like that. Yay. All right. So <laughs> notice that the only time for and, you have three of one and one of the other. You have three falses and one true. The one true is true, true. For or, you have three of one, one of the other. The, the uh, unique condition is, what, is when they're both false, if that help burns it in. All right, in logical terms, you can treat 
and as though it, it means multiply. And you can treat or as though it means addition. And if you ever go and you take a course on logic, and yeah, you can go and get three hours of, of credit for taking a logic course at a four-year college. The proof of that would be is if you treat falses as zeros and you treat trues as one. So what if you have zero times zero, zero times one, one times zero, one times one? Well, what's zero times zero? It's zero. What's zero times one? Zero. <laughs> one times zero? Oh. Zero. Yeah, and one times one is equal to one. Okay, now which of these truth tables Sorry, guys, again, I'm hiding it behind the screen. Which of these truth tables does that look like? It looks like the and. So and and multiply look the same. Or 0 plus 0 is equal to 0, but the rest of them are not equal to 0. 0 plus 1 equals 0 and 1. Zero, 1 plus 0 equals 1, and 1 plus 1 is equal to one. 2. But we're going to pretend it's 1, right? Okay. <laughs> it's non-zero. We're still in Boolean math at universe where there's only two values, 0 and non-zero. Okay. And so this looks a lot like or, right? Where as long as one of these is non-zero, the result is 1. All right, we're going to do one more little thing with this. We need to find a good place in our code to insert it. I'll probably just stick it up at the top of main. Wow, I sure did hit a lot of enters. Okay. Let's get two pieces of data from the customer, from the user. We're going to use two input statements. A is equal to input enter a number. B is equal to input, enter another. Now input returns a string. So we're going to have to convert those to numeric values. I like converting things to float because if you type in a decimal and then try to convert it to an int, it generates a runtime error and stops the program. So a is equal to float A, and B is equal to float B. If you want, you can combine those two operations into a single statement. C is equal to float, parentheses, input, parentheses, enter yet another. Like that. If you want to do it in one line of code, great. Want to do it in two lines? Hey, whatever. All right, now we're going to create some Boolean variables. We're going to pretend that A was a temperature. So boil is equal to A greater than 212. And again, the parentheses are not necessary, but it, it helps me read it. And freeze is equal to parentheses A less than 32. And now we're going to do a command based on that result. If boil is equal to true, with a capital T, print A is boiling. It's exactly correct. You do not need to put the equals true. If bo not boil, 
print A is not boiling. And I could have just used an if statement to do the same thing. If freeze colon print A is freezing. else colon print a is not freezing. I'm just playing with syntax a little bit. What an if statement is expecting after it is a logical expression. And a logical expression is one that returns true or false. So here we calculate whether boil is greater than 212 or not. And if it is, we print it's boiling. But we don't have to put equal equal true. We can leave it out. Why? Because boil is in itself a Boolean value. So that's why I just worded this as if freeze. This logic and this logic do the same thing just by virtue of if this is not true, this is the expression that's going to run. That's the statement that will run. That's what else means. Else means that if the prior if was not true, if that code was not run, then it will run whatever is under else. Same thing as this. This is a far more common way of writing it. I cannot think of a compelling reason when I would write it like that. I suppose I should run it. But you know what? If I have syntax errors, as long as we're getting the idea at this point, I guess I'd give myself a one. But uh, I don't care if the code that you upload during our, our in-class tutorials has index errors or not, because I know that when we're typing. Okay, so 12. 12 should say that it's not boiling. That's true. It's 12 degrees and that it is freezing. And I could continue to, you know, I could enter 1,000 degrees and it should say that it was boiling and not freezing. Yeah, so it's boiling and it's not freezing. Now it really is about time to take attendance and then be done. We can hang out for a few minutes if you do want to fix syntax errors and stuff like that. Also, if you want me to just print this out, I can do that and I will upload the notes and you could, you know, look at it at home. That's not to, not to discourage you from taking your own notes. Just if I've got it typed in, why not? <laughs>